Um, Steve, um, yep, is our our um, sales director, and, and has how many harvests under your belt now, Steve? Well, thirty three. Thirty three. So certainly a lot more than me. Um, and we also have um, Mike Benson joining us uh, from Sunny Wigan. Hello, everyone. Um, um, and Mike has been with Chris for a few years now um, and is a, a well-credentialed brewer. So he, Mike's going to be talking about the um, any of the changes within the barley and therefore the malt um, and the impact that those changes might have on brewing conditions um, and some hints and tips to follow as we transition into the new crop. Um, so it's going to be a, a pretty detailed presentation today. Um, we're, we're going to be running for the best part of an hour. Um, and as I said, we will have time for Q&A at the end. Um, now, Steve's in, Steve should be in charge of the slides. This is where the technology will... Um... <laughs> there we go. <laughs> who, who can share? All panellists. There we go. That's it. Steve right. enabled me. I can't. Oh, it's all there good. All good. We like to keep things nice and casual. <laughs> so have you cut your slides yeah. there, Steve? There we are. Fantastic. Okay, great. Um, so I was just going to kick us off with one slide, uh, just detailing a little bit about our actual barley sourcing at Crisp, um, because we do have uh, um, a number of sites across the UK. Can you jump on to that, Steve? Next slide, please. That we go. That's it. That's all you need to say. <laughs> so... Um, so many of you out there do know us as a business, um, but perhaps um, some international guests won't know kind of where, where we're located, but uh, the Crisp HQ is our great Rybra site down in um, the, the, the south east of England and East Anglia, specifically North Norfolk, where we've been malting barley for over 150 years. Um, so the company's been going since 1870. We celebrated that 150th anniversary two years ago. Um, and the North Norfolk area, as many people will know, is, uh, has fantastic barley growing conditions, uh, specifically for the kind of um, malting barley that we're, that we're looking for, for that low nitrogen, um, high extract barley for ale brewing and indeed um, for some of our distilling customers as well. Um, so we source within that Norfolk area. Um, Norfolk generally returns a good harvest, but um, on, the, on the rare occasion that it doesn't, we, we hedge that sourcing by having some additional sourcing in the south of England as well, and we have a, a barley catchment area and a drying and storage facility on the M4 at Membury, um, down in sort of um, Wiltshire area um, near the Cotswolds. Um, that's also shown on the map there. And then, of course, we also source up in, in Scotland as we've got two maltings that uh, pretty much solely service uh, the distilling market, although also some craft brewing customers as well. So hello to any of the Scottish uh, brewers or distillers that have joined us today. Um, so yes, um, you can see the darker areas on this map um, are the, the, the prime barley, malting barley growing regions in the UK. And obviously there's a big catchment area up there in Scotland along the East Coast, Murrayshire, Aberdeenshire, um, coming down through Fife um, and, and even down towards our Alwa maltings in, in the central um, area of Scotland. So fantastic barley growing um, catchment areas that we're able to tap into in both England and in Scotland. Um, we also operate um, a, a, a farmer um, relationships um, with over 270 farmers in the Norfolk area. Those are on long-term contracts um, and that allows us to develop you know, long lasting and trusting relationships with farmers um, for specific varieties. Um, and you know, we're talking about farmers that have been with us for a long time that really know their farms, they know their fields, they know what grows well, um, when and how, and um, that trust within uh, those relationships um, and specifically what we call the ABC growing group, which is um, Adams and Howling, Badams and Crisp, two of our key merchants with ourselves. Um, that that growing group returns an awful lot of our um, of our barley crop, um, and it's a fantastic mechanism that was set up about fifteen years ago. Steve, is that right? Some, something something like that. Something I'll like that. You. Yeah, um, that's been that's been going um, going really well for us, and that um, that that gives us a real security when it comes to barley sourcing, because of course, without high quality barley, then we simply cannot produce 
high quality, consistent malt. So um, farmer relationships are absolutely key to what we do at Crisp. Um, so that just gives you an idea of the catchment of the sourcing. Um, you can also see on this map here where the maltings are located. So, you know, the malting is very close to those barley growing regions, which means it's an extremely local crop to us. Um, it's, uh, you know, relatively short distances from farms maltings. And we have on each of our sites, a, a large percentage of our barley is stored within the maltings itself, which again gives us fantastic security over that crop. It means that we're not buying bits and pieces throughout uh, the supply year, it means that we're, we're securing the vast majority of what we need at harvest um, and getting it dried down um, to that critical moisture um, so that it's safe for storage and get it, get it into our own silos and sheds. Um, so again, all part of that model. The malting part is such a, it's a relatively small part of all the different steps that go into um, securing um, this, um, this, this high quality product for, for our customers. So that's by way of an introduction. I'm going to absolutely step away at this point and hand over to Steve to talk us through the ins and outs of the UK growing season. There we are. Thank you very much, Colin. Um, <clears throat> good introduction. Right, yes, I'm here to uh, sort of talk you through the, the growing season, as Colin said, um, and then we'll have a look at the quality of the crop that we've been handed for the coming season. Um, and then at the end, because um, I think news is starting to get out there that the uh, prices have been a, a, a touch changeable this year. Uh, we'll have a look at where the, where the markets are going. So um, starting with the UK growing season. So in terms of the, the cropping, you can have winter crops, you can have spring crops, um, but the, the autumn time is important for the, for the planting of the winter crops. Um, that, was, that was fine this, win this autumn. Winter was, was, was no troubles. Um, and really the, the key growing time is the spring for the planting of the spring crops um, and also for the growth of the whole crops in general. So what you need is, is a, a nice balance of moisture and sunshine to, to bring the crops on. So um, where were we this year? So we started, um, started out, if you cast your minds back to the start of lockdown actually, last year um, when everyone was sort of it was a bit of a novelty and we could sit in our gardens and drink beer at home because we weren't allowed to go anywhere else um, April and was was very dry last year um, nice um, nice weather well actually this year even though it didn't feel like it at the time it was actually drier this year so that wasn't a good start to to the the spring growing season crops didn't grow um, farmers couldn't plant anything if they did plant something it didn't come out of the ground for, for a couple of months. Um, and so, you know, it didn't look that great. What the, the reason that we got away with this drought this year, um, the dry April, was April was actually a hell of a lot colder than last year. Um, I've just realized that I've explained this graph without actually explaining the graph, the chart. These are um, rainfall amounts compared to the 30 year average. So this is the average of the UK from 1981 to 2010. And this is rainfall. Anything that's brown is drier than average. Anything that's blue is wetter than average. Um, and so you can see it was dry. And this is a temperature chart. Blue is colder. Red is hotter. And you can see last year, sitting in your garden, drinking beer, one and a half to two and a half, even maybe two and a half to three and a half degrees warmer than the 30 year average. Um, this year, you know, even two and a half to three and a half degrees colder than average. In, in the North Norfolk area. So we've seen a sort of five degree plus swing in the temperatures. So that's why things didn't grow. It was too dry and it was too cold. However, we got away with the drought because it was so cold, the crops weren't that thirsty. So actually, you know, we, we did get away with it. And then moving on, last year, the drought stayed. May was extremely dry, caused a lot of crop, crop stress. Um, and that impacted the growing season hugely. This year, we had the rainfall in May. That was followed by a period of warmth. So we actually ended up with a fantastic growing season through, through May and June. Once things got going, May and June, fantastic. And we saw a lot of green growth, uh, a lot of tillering, a lot of yield potential coming up, um, which was fantastic news. So 
Yeah, the rhyme of the day, wet may save the day. Just remember that one. Um, so then moving on to the summer. So the summer is obviously important for, for the ripening of the crop um, and for um, the, getting the harvest in. Because of the, the dry, cold April, things were behind. We were later going into harvest, probably by three weeks. Um, and then we got into August. And if you remember August this year, um, it just felt like it was, it was really wet and um, out on my, on my bike between showers, um, looking at the fields, thinking nothing's being harvested at the moment. Um, and so bizarrely, it looks like the driest wet harvest on record because this is the rainfall chart for August. And it was actually drier than average in large parts of the country, especially in East Anglia. So how can that be? Well, if you then look at, this is the days of rain. So the amount of days we actually had rain, uh, we had more wet days it just didn't rain much, but it rained in more on more days. So this delayed the harvest, combined with the fact that this is now the sunshine chart. Um, gray is dull, and it was very, very dull in August. So the impact of the wet, the the lack of sunshine in August was that between showers we weren't seeing the crop dry quickly. So farmers trying to get in there to do their harvest. It was, it was taking longer to dry the crops off. And some of the crops as they were ripening, especially the winter barley, so not so much August, but maybe June, end of June into July, when the grain fill is happening, they want some sunshine to fill those grains out. We didn't see that happening in earnest in the winter crop. Um, and so we've seen, we've seen a um, slightly smaller crop in terms of grain size in the winters than we would, ex would have expected otherwise. The other, the other thing about the delay in the harvest and the lack of sunshine, we have seen slightly more dormancy from this year's crop than we would normally do. And that's the sort of natural period of recovery from the grain from harvest time to when it will grow and we can start malting it again. So we've seen that period slightly extended, um, so which is impacted by uh, the weather um, in, during the ripening phase. So that was the weather. Um, having said about the problems and the grumbles along the way, it was a much more normal growing season than last year, where we had the stress of the drought all the way through into June. Um, and so we've, we've seen much better quality, um, especially in England this year. Um, so have a look at some data. So this is AHDB harvest data, AHDB, uh, the Agricultural and Horticultural Development Board. Uh, used to be known the HG, as the HGCA, the Homegrown Cereals Authority. Um, it's a farmer-funded, um, government-run body, independent body, doing a lot of research um, and data collection. Um, so they've provided these stats. They get lots of barley samples. So this isn't just malting barley. This is all barley, um, all winter barley on this slide. And we can see 2020 versus 2021. And the key number in here really is the nitrogen content. Last year, 176, a bit too high for, for the craft brewing sector. Um, and some of it was a lot higher than we really wanted. This year, 1.57, much more in the usable range. And actually a tighter standard deviation, meaning there's a tighter spread around that than last year where there was a bit more variation. The specific weight, the weight of a of a hectolitre of grain is similar. The screenings, the thin corns, as I mentioned about the thinner corns, um, there's slightly more thinner corns. So those are corns that would fall through a 2.25 millimetre slotted screen, um, slightly higher. Um, and the, the large grains, so those that would re, wouldn't go through a two and a half millimetre sieve, 85%. Um, so that's 10% lower than last year, indicating that we've got less of the big bold grains more in that in between. And the, the 6.7 standard deviation here shows that there's a, a wider spread of qualities when it comes to grain size in the winters. As for our intake, so as I say that, oops, sorry, that is all um, barley, winter barley, feed and um, malting. So when we just actually bring out the, the malting barley varieties in here, um, you can see 1.4, 1.44 from Arisota, um, relatively low screenings, low, slightly higher than last year, and this smaller grain size, 
I mean, for Marisotta, that is a that is pretty good anyway, because Marisotta is is 55 years old um, and is doing doing quite well. Thank you very much for an old variety. Um, in terms of the the graph of the intake, so you can see you know a nice normal distribution curve. Um, you know the the pale ale, malt, barley's looking good. You know all usable stuff. A bit more at the higher end. Um, but we do have need for some of the higher nitrogen into some of the export lager specifications. Um, Maris Otter, slightly higher, um, but still all very usable. You know, the average in the one fours, so a much better crop than last year. If you look at the comparison, having said much better crop than last year, you can see 163 to 144, so a 0.2 drop this year on the nitrogen content for the Otter. Slightly smaller grain size to say, you know, 10, 10 lower. That was a big bold grain last year, but it came with the high nitrogen. So there should be a good potential from this year's crop. If we look at last year's crop, you can see you know, this year's in the blue. It's uh, the nice normal distribution curve, all pretty usable. Last year, you can see we had to cut off um, at 165 and the majority of it was at 165 and we never really got to the top of the normal distribution curve and volumes were limited um, because of the amount that we, we, hadn't, we had to reject because it just wasn't, it, it didn't make the grade. Much the same on the, on the best ale extra pails, um, 165 down to 14, um, you know, the, the lower grain size as well, um, and even probably more pronounced, lovely more normal distribution curve this year with a, with a bit of a tail out to, to the 175s. Um, but last year, you can see the cutoff was at 175. Um, the odd one sneaked in, but you know it was still going up. So a much higher crop last year. So a much better quality crop coming out of a hopefully a more normal growing season. Um, so that will give us a, a decent um, crop to to malt and a decent crop to brew with. Just touching on Scotland. So Scotland actually last year escaped the worst of the drought. They had a pretty good year last year. And so the results for this year are, are pretty similar to last year. Um, and the, we've got a 1.4, 1.42 nitrogen. So good low nitrogens, which is what you want for distilling. Um, fairly bold grains still, um, which, is, which is good. Um, distillers are just looking for really as low a nitrogen as possible to maximize the extract, which will maximize your spirit yield potential. Um, so it's a great looking crop up there. And you know, if you were going to be shown a normal distribution curve in your maths class way back when, um, you know, it would look like that. So again, it's all usable, all around that one four nitrogen. So it looks like we've got a good uh, potential for, for good distilling malt for this coming season too. So that's a, a very quick run through the, um, the growing season. Um, Obviously, we'll come back and uh, talk about um, the quality. If you have any questions, we'll do that at the end. I'm now going to hand over to, to Mike to talk you through the brewing implications, and I shall be back in a few minutes to uh, to talk about uh, the market. Cheers, Steve. So, don't, don't go too far because I need you to change my my slides. From I'm not going. I'm not going anywhere, mate. Oh, yeah. nice. I want to uh, find out what's going to happen. <laughs> Next slide, please. Okay, so we'll just start with um, just reminding everyone what malting barley quality means through the brew house and pretty much through all the stages through brewing, we have an impact um, on the quality of the beer. So the bits that we're going to talk about today pretty much is, is going to cover um, how we think the, the 2021 crop is going to perform through the brew house and some of the things that you just need to keep your eye on as you're going through and you can see just from the 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 the, the picture there it, it pretty much every part of the brewery malting barley has got something to do with it um so do you want to move on steve so the two things that steve's talked about in the field uh, what we look at is the corn size and the nitrogen uh now these are we talk about these quite a bit because we can make some assumptions of, of how we think the, the barley is going to malt and, and perform in the brewery from them so the first one's the corn size, which, as Steve says, um, we assess through passing through a 2.25 mil screen on a 2.5 millimeter screen. And then from there, we can see 
the distribution and what the kind of grain we're, we're going to get. So we want nice, even grain sizes so we get a good, even uptake of moisture when we come to steep it. If we get a nice uptake of moisture, then we're going to get a nice, even germination, um, which is going to basically make it perform much better within the brew house. Um, the main thing to think about this year is just on the size of the grain is basically just a, a little mill change. And we can see through the, the, the four last harvests um, through the year, last year was, was quite good grain size, uh, but quite high nitrogen. This year it's dropping, dropped down a little bit, but anything over 85 is pretty good. Um, and we can see from one of the slides Steve's just said before as well, that the actual specific weight of the grains is is quite high as well. It's only a little bit down on, on last year. So we're pretty much going to get decent sized grains uh, that should malt quite easily. Do you want to move on, Steve? Um, and the next one is nitrogen. So it, it, the nitrogen is, is really important. Um, basically high nitrogen grains can also make it really difficult to steep and, and get the moisture within the grain. And basically that's due to nitrogen being quite um, dense. So the, the, the grain doesn't take up the, the water too easily, um, which again, if we don't get a nice steeping, then we get a little bit of uneven modification, which can affect you guys in the brew house. Um, the other important part is there is only a certain amount of, of a certain amount of room within the, the, the barley. Um, and if there's more nitrogen, it means there's, there's less sugar there. So it affects the extract quite a bit. So again, nitrogen, hugely important, and it has quite a major effect on um, how we modify the grain, how much extracts we're gonna get out of it, the free amino nitrogen that it can produce, enzyme production, and then issues through the brew house through clarity um, and, and processing further downstream for, for filtration as well. Okay, Steve, do you wanna go on? So the main things that we need to have a look at this year um, are the extract, the fan, the DP, the clarity, and then the PSY for the distillers there, uh, which I might let Colin say something about. Um, so extract wise, we are probably going to see slightly smaller grain sizes this year. So the first thing you need to do is basically check your mill. Um, there's already quite a few brewers asked us what our mill settings are. Um, at the minute in time, we've, we've not changed them, uh, but we'll be keeping a close eye on that. Um, and if you want to um, drop us a line for any information, then, then please feel free to contact us on that. Um, so there might be a slight mill change setting. Um, again, the dent, grain density is pretty high and we've got much lower nitrogen this year. So we're kind of expecting the same extract performance as last year. And hopefully we might see a little bit of an uptake as well. Um, the fan, so free main nitrogen, we need fan for yeast growth. And what happens there is proteolytic enzymes reduce protein within the grain to soluble protein and then amino acids. Um, and the grain provides the protein for that and the, um, the enzymes as well. So the, the lower the protein within the grain potential the less fan that can be produced but we're in a real sweet spot at 1.4 nitrogen um where we kind of get the most extract we can get without really suffering with a fan so we're expecting the fan to be the same as last year as well um so on standard beers with normal alcohols and, and pretty low adjunct rates shouldn't really bring any issues uh, but if we are going to produce some quite high alcohol beers or some uh, big adjunct beers it might be worthwhile speaking to Vickers or, or uh, Lallemand or Murphy's just to see if there's any kind of um, extra use nutrient that, that may be needed. Uh, diastatic power it's the same the, the amount of nitrogen within the grain dictates um, the enzymes that are available again we're in a real sweet spot at, at 1.4. So we're not expecting any issues. We, we're expecting to see the same amount of levels as last year. 
Um, and it's the same advice um, if you're looking to produce lots of lots of adjunct high beers, then you may need to speak to Vickers and uh, Murphy's around maybe adding some extra um, enzymes to help you out. The clarity is probably going to be the biggest change this year, dropping down from 1.65 nitrogen down to 1.4 is, is pretty big. So the first thing is always going to be kettle optimizations. Murphy's, uh, Murphy's and Vickers, again, very, very good at helping out with that. Um, but also Isinglass and auxiliary optimization for the cask. And you may also want to think about getting the filter, uh, the filter guys in and maybe just check the filter regime and different powders to use. Um, should all be good news. It should be using less findings. Um, and it should make it very, very, um, it should make it nice and easy to process as well. Uh, Colin, do you want to mention anything about PSY? If you're still there? Um, yes, I can. Yeah. Um, so the generally we, we come on to the Scottish um, new seasons crop a little bit later. So it's still kind of early days in terms of malting that. Um, so we, we don't have yet um, a, a solid record on the new crop PSY being the predicted spirit yield. However, given the way that the nitrogens are, given the boldness of the corns compared to last year, then we would we would fully expect PSYs to be at or slightly better than um, than the previous crop um, across uh, across Scotland. So, and um, things looking very positive, I would say, for the distilling outlook for spirit yields. Um, something obviously that's uh, that's always worth checking with the maltster um, is the gelatinization temperature of the grain. So, as as we get into malting that um, the, the new crop, we'll be checking the gelatinization temperature of the starch, um, just in case any mashing temperatures need to be adjusted within the distillery and um, your first water temperatures might need to be tweaked ever so slightly depending on what the gelatinization temperatures are so um, that's certainly a conversation have with us um, as as we progress into the new crop um, and we'll be able to report that uh, directly to the distillers. Cheers Colin. So I suppose in summary it's looking like a really good crop quality wise it's a real nice sweet spot where the, the nitrogen is um, should be nice and easy to malt. Um, basically, the advice would be just to check your mill, keep your eyes on the mill, give us a shout if you need any help with adjustments. Me and Stuart are more than happy to come around and, and, and help you out with our little box. And yeah, speak to the guys at, at Lallemond and, and Murphy's around any if you've got any concerns around diastatic power or, or fan. But all in all, pre pretty good crop, and we're we're excited to um, get you guys brewing on it. Cheers, Steve. There we are. So, oops, sorry, getting carried away there. Spoken like a true brewer. Crop will be easy to malt. I tell you, you're not a maltster. There we are. Anyway, thank you, thank you, Mike. Um, moving on to have a look at the the pricing. So, just a few sort of background bits of the on the on the pricing. So when we're talking about grain pricing, um, especially in the UK, uh, we're talking about fundamentally feed barley, um, feed wheat, and then the premium crops of those two, there's uh, malting barley and there's milling, milling wheat, uh, milling wheat going for, for flour. Um, and so in terms of the price gradient, generally wheat is, uh, feed wheat is priced above, um, above feed barley. Um, and then the premium wheat, the premium and the malting barley, um, they're going to be priced above their, their counterparts. So malting barley is always going to be priced over feed barley because if it doesn't get a premium, then it will be sold as feed barley anyway. And uh, so, so in the, and the same for the wheat. Um, so the base is always the feed base. Generally, wheat is higher priced than barley. And so, um, and because wheat is the biggest crop um, in the, in the country um, that has a better, more fluid market. So we generally track the wheat market. So if we look at a pricing graph for 2021 crop, so these this graph is showing um, in the blue, we have the uh, feed wheat um, because there isn't a quoted feed barley um, price. We've got a feed wheat price, which is on the London, London futures market. 
The red line is a milling wheat, the French wheat. So this is based out of Paris. So it's a French quote, um, but it's for milling wheat, so for premium wheat. And then the green line is malting barley and the Danish malting barley, Dana, Denmark are one of the biggest exporters of malting barley. So there's an active uh, FOB market with FOB is, is port side, so delivered port. Um, so that's a, effectively a sort of a delivered price um, of malting barley. So you can see that, yes, the feed wheat um, is trading at a discount to the, to the milling wheat, as it would be. Um, and in this case, we see that the, the green, the malting barley is trading at a premium over the wheat as well. So as, as we've gone through the season, so this starts last July, um, and so through our droughty season last year, and you can see the price was fairly stable through into the spring. And then if you recall, I was saying how, uh, how dry and cold April was, there were concerns that we could be having a repeat of the previous year's crop. So the markets went up. In May, we had some rain. So essentially the rain eased people's fears about the crops. So the markets went down. And then, so what happened in July? So this is where markets start to become more globally influenced. So we had um, the ultra heat in the United States, North America. Um, so we had that period of, of real hot temperatures, uh, people dying in the heat. The crops were, were just being scorched up. Um, and so we've seen a shortage of global shortage of feed grains. So that saw the, the market start to rise on the fact that we were going to have problems in potentially in Brazil with the corn crop, um, definitely in North America with the barley crop and the wheat crop and the corn crop. Um, so we saw the markets rise, um, bit of a correction, um, maybe, I think, I think they actually announced that the crops were going to be slightly better, a bit more of a positive report. Um, and then actually, no, we were wrong and the, and the markets have carried on going away. And we've also heard uh, reports from other markets now have come in, like the Russian crop isn't really up to where we wanted it to be. Um, so, so we're seeing the markets rising away and you can see that the, the, the milling wheat is still trading at a premium over, over the feed wheat. So why has the green line gone, gone even higher? And we've seen this premium over wheat for the malting barley go from virtually nothing in, in the early part of the year to best part of 65 pounds now. So, so the malting barley harvest um, in, in the Northern Hemisphere um, completed through August. Obviously it went up on the back of the, the feed, um, but it kept going. So what happened was we've got, I've already mentioned that the pricing is based on, on FOB Denmark. The Danish crop, they normally have something like a million tonnes of surplus malting barley to export to other countries, other deficit countries in Europe and, and around the world. Their yields were very disappointing compared to expectation. So that meant that what was already forecast to be a fairly tight supply and demand in Europe became a deficit. We also saw some losses in the crops um, in France, in northeastern France. If you remember the floods, um, severe flooding that uh, caused unfortunately deaths in Germany. Um, those, that flood that weather system um, went round into northern France and uh, damaged some of the crops there. So there were some losses there. So these shortages have seen the market rise um, on the scarcity of the crop. And subsequently we've seen Canada come in and they've been buying malting barley. Their barley crop was written down from something like a, originally a 14 million tonne expectation down to seven. Um, so we've seen that demand go up as well. So we've just seen a huge demand for, for grains um, and on, a, on a shortage. Um, so that's, that's the problem we have. Um, there's a knock-on effect too into next year. Um, so we can see this is next year's, so December pricing. We've already got um, the, the wheat price approaching 200 pounds a tonne. Um, and we've got the, the malting barley price heading for 220 pounds a tonne. So we're already seeing this demand going up. And the interesting, another interesting conundrum that we've got in here um, is, is energy pricing. So the energy pricing, so this is a baseload electricity pricing. 
which really is just showing you um, the, the price levels that we've been at historically for the year, annual volumes, and then you can see that we've just gone way, way up. Um, and it's easing back a little bit at the moment, but it's nowhere near where we have been in historical times. So that's had two impacts. That's obviously had a big impact on our milk pricing because our, our energy costs have gone up hugely. Um, bear in mind that gas has pretty much followed this or the electricity has followed the gas because uh, a lot of our power stations are, are still gas fired. Um, so they generally follow each other. So we've seen gas and electricity go up and I'm sure the brewers and distillers amongst you will have seen, seen that and felt the pain of that too. Um, so that's putting pressure on our malt price. That's also putting pressure on the farmers because the farmers are looking at what they're going to grow next year. The prices are going up, looks very attractive. However, fertilizer manufacturer, the energy component in the cost of manufacture is about 80% of the cost. So we're seeing fertilizer prices going up. We've seen fertilizer, fertilizer um, factories stop, as you will be aware, because that caused a, a brief shortage of CO2 because that's one of the byproducts. So it'll be interesting what crop decisions we get for next year. We might see more malting barley, for example, because it requires less fertilizer. And actually, if you end up with low nitrogen, it's not so much of an issue, um, but it will impact the yield potentially. So we've got a lot of, a lot of mix going on in the markets at the moment. But the upshot is this year's grain pricing much higher than last year's. And this year we've had the double whammy because we've also got huge energy prices compared to the previous year. So, I mean, that's, that's where the markets have left us. We've had a good quality crop in the UK. Um, it should be, you know, it should more, more easily. Um, as, as Mike said, it's a more normal growing season. It should brew well. There should be good extract in there. Unfortunately, the price is, uh, is, is going to be up on last year. Um, and unfortunately, there's nothing we can really do about that because that's where, that's where the markets are, as you have just seen.